Welcome to this gathering of Spring Creek Christian Church. My name is Pastor Jeffrey Hayes. Grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come. We gather this morning to worship our sovereign God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to get equipped with his word that we might bring it to all of life. This morning I want to open us up with Revelation chapter 13, verses 7 and following. Revelation chapter 13, verses 7 and following. Uh, this will uh, intersect with the portion of, from Daniel that we'll be studying this morning. Revelation 13, 7 says, It was also given to him, that is the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth during the tribulation will worship him, the Antichrist. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Let's pray. Father, we humble ourselves and bow down to you in adoration as we recognize that you are sovereign Lord over all, that you move and control peoples, even evil kings. We thank you, Lord, for the one who is slain. We, we thank you that your son is the author of the book of life. And we thank you, Father, that from the foundation of the world, our names have been written in it because we put our faith in Jesus as the Messiah. We pray, Father, that as we come and sing to you, as we give our tithes and offerings to you, as we partake of your son's supper, as we listen to you speak to us through your preached word, that we would do this all in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. And in so doing, give thanks to you for your sovereignty in our salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abraham that he will be a great nation, that God will make Abraham a great nation. And then he continues and, said, all, and says, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you, through, through Abraham. And, and this is a, a prophecy in Holy Scripture that is an amazing truth that Abraham lives in, in sight of his whole life. But in just two chapters later, God gives Abraham a dream. After this amazing truth about what's going to happen to Abraham and the Jewish people, God gives Abraham a dream where he tells them, oh, by the way, your people are going to be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years in a land that is not their own. Whoa. How do you put these two things together? I'm going to be a great nation. Every family on earth is going to be blessed through my name somehow. And yet our people are going to be enslaved and oppressed by Pharaoh. For 400 years, it's God revealing through Holy Scripture that in his sovereignty, he even uses pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel. Did you get all that? In God's sovereignty, in Genesis 14, he revealed for the first time that he, God even uses evil pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel. Fast forward seven centuries, about seven centuries, God gives Daniel a vision and in this vision is is a ram and a goat and in this vision Daniel sees this goat do horrific things to the Jewish people it is another instance where God reveals to us through holy scripture that in his sovereignty he even has control over evil people in order to accomplish his will for Israel God uses evil rulers to fulfill what he wants, what he has promised to the Jewish people. The question before you and me is, do we believe it? Do we believe that? Do we believe that God is truly sovereign over heaven and earth? That he is the supreme ruler over every inch of terra firma, every grain of sand responds to Yahweh Elohim. Is he sovereign over evil people? Is he sovereign in your life today? Is he really sovereign over Israel? 
you look at the history of the Jewish people and, and do you really see a sovereign God in the Holocaust? 400 years of oppression under Pharaoh? The anti-Semiticism that you're seeing from our own country today? The bigger question for you is, well, if God is sovereign over Israel, isn't he also sovereign over this church, the one gathered here today? Isn't he the supreme ruler over you being here? Does he not have a destiny for this church in this moment at this time? So I think we all need to believe, we all need to see how sovereign God is, sovereign enough to use pagan rulers to accomplish his future for Israel. Because once you get that, and once you believe that, suddenly you bring it to his sovereignty over our church, and the, your view of the church is significantly elevated because you realize that Christ is the Lord of this church, that he has a destiny for this people at this time. So, how does God use pagan rulers to accomplish his future for Israel? How does God utilize Gentile rulers to achieve his destiny for Israel? Please open up your Holy Bible to Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. Would you please rise in honor of the word of God? Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to go all the way to verse 14. The word of God says to us, In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and, my, and I myself was beside the Elai Canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor were there, was there anyone to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased and magnified himself. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled upon him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. And in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Amen. Please be seated. How does God use pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel? How does God utilize Gentile rulers to achieve his destiny for Israel? Starting in verse 1, let's recognize where we're at. Remember, we have been studying the English Bible, but in the original manuscripts, we at this point, switch from Aramaic back to Hebrew. 
So in the original text, chapter 8, verse 1, switches to Hebrew, and we interpret from that that this section is specifically for the Jews. It's going to be about them living under Gentile kings, but this is God's message for his people, whereas the Aramaic section that we just finished was for both. It's the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king. So this is 12 years before Daniel chapter 5. Remember the handwriting on the wall? Remember Belshazzar's great feast? This would be 12 years prior to that, and it's two years after the dream that Daniel had in Daniel chapter 7. Now you need to know that this is a great, great battle because liberal theologians don't want Daniel chapter 8 to be 12 years before Daniel chapter 5 because they want Daniel to be writing about things that have already happened, not things that the Almighty God has revealed to him through this vision because if Daniel is writing ahead of time about things that are happening, suddenly God is real and the word of God is living and active and can contains prophecies that God is in control of. So the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, we're talking about 550 BC, two years post Daniel chapter 7. He says he looked in the vision. So this is different. He's not a, having a dream that contains visions. This is a pure vision. This is a pure prophetic revelation that Daniel is awake for. He's not sleeping during this one like he was the previous one. And he's looking in this vision, and what does he see but the citadel of Susa? Literally, literally in the Hebrew, it's Shushan. We always see it as Susa. But the amazing thing is, this is 100 years before Nehemiah Susa. This is 100 years before the Persians make Susa the great thing where Esther, the great capital where Esther is taken captive and becomes the queen. So this is a whole century before Susa is anything that we could even understand reading the Old Testament about, which is just proof, church, that this word is living and supernatural. The word you handle is alive. So he's looking, and he, he was in the citadel of Susa. You're going to have to interpret whether or not he is suddenly transported there or he is somehow standing outside and he sees himself there. This citadel, this capital, this city is in the province of Elam, which is a, just a portion of, of Babylon. So, you know, like we would say Logansport is in Cass County. That, that's what we have here going on. Susa is in the province of Elam. He looks in the vis vision and he, he sees him side by this, this canal, which is, which is a, a literal river that is right in this area where Daniel is talking about. So archaeology proves this vision to be true. And Daniel raises his eyes and he looks and suddenly he has this vividness. I envision the vision sort of being out there in the distance and then this behold is boom. God doesn't want him to miss this. He's emotionally surprised by how vivid what he sees is. And what he sees is a ram with two horns standing in front of the canal. Now, we shouldn't be intimidated. You know, we've been digging deep in the beasts and horns, and so we're all about this stuff now, right? We know that horns have typically, in prophecy, represented either kings or kingdoms. We're just coming out of Daniel chapter 7, where we had this whole vision of these four beasts. So we always want to keep that in mind. We want to study where we are from where we've been, because this, is, this book is even laid out under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He sees this ram with two horns, and the two horns were long. It's a hard word in English. The two horns have this appearance of being exalted, mighty. There, there's something special about them. So it, in English, that could carry over to long, but it, it's more about their appearance to Daniel than their actual length is what he's trying to communicate. And the English language just escapes us there. But one is longer than the other, and the longer one came up last. So in this vision, he actually sees these horns growing. And one comes up last. And he sees this ram budding westward, northward, and southward. He, he, he is goring things. He is pushing things in these three directions. And as close Bible students, we want to take note of that. Wait a minute. Where's eastward? 
It's only three directions here. So we want to we want to take a note of that. We got we got two horns. One is longer than the other. One comes up last. Now we only got three out of four directions on the globe. That's significant. And no other beast could stand before him. No other beast had the power to prevail against this ram with these two horns. So he is just pushing his way wherever he wants to go in these three directions. And he might come up to another beast and he just throws him to the ground. It says he did as he pleased. He did literally what his heart desired. And make note of this, he magnified himself. This ram with his two horns boasted he made himself great of these accolades that he did so at this point we just need to you know take a deep breath and say okay this is weird i get it but coming out of daniel chapter 7 and knowing what's unique these two horns we we could should we could see or should see similarities between the beast from daniel chapter 7 and you remember the second beast what was unique about it but one side was raised up higher than the other so we could connect the two horns of the ram with the two sides of the bear, and we see, hey, wait, that, that fits together, right? One side of the bear was higher than the other. One horn is longer than the other. And what was unique about that bear, but it had these ribs in its mouth. You remember how many? It had three ribs. So you think, well, three ribs, there's only three directions, westward, northward, southward. And now we can be confident that under the power of the Holy Spirit, we've made a connection. We're talking about the same people here. The bear and the ram with the two horns. The three ribs are the three kingdoms that this other kingdom conquers. The three directions were the three directions that this kingdom conquered. Purposely not trying to tell you who it is because that's all in the interpretation of the te in the text next week. It magnified itself. But look at verse 5. While I was beholding, behold, another vivid vision comes, a male goat. Literally in the Hebrew, it's, it's the goat of the goats. I think we would say in our, in our common parlance, the man. It's the he goat, the buck. He's coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth. What's unique about it? He does so without touching the ground. We got to make note of that. Well, that's, that's interesting. He is running fast without touching the ground. And this goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Conspicuous meaning um, interesting or noteworthy. It had a special appearance to it but between its eyes. And he immediately comes up to the ram that has the two horns. Comes up beside him, beside the ram, and he's enraged at him. He is overflowing with anger, bitterness, cruelty at the ram with the two horns. And what does he do? He gores it. He strikes the horn with this conspic he strikes the ram with this conspicuous horn and he shatters the two horns. He breaks it into pieces. And this ram, which was so powerful, had absolutely no strength to withstand this goat with this conspicuous horn. Nothing. So the goat hurls this ram to the ground. He tramples underfoot. You got to see a king when you know you got to see a king conquering somebody and stepping on him as a symbol that this person is now submitted this goat is sorry this goat is stepping trampling on this ram um, and there's none to rescue him there's none to deliver the ram from the power of this goat verse 8 then the male goat magnified himself too oh so there's a, there's a connection right the ram magnified himself and he's cut down. This goat is magnifying himself. It says exceedingly. And what happens? But as soon as he was mighty, as soon as this goat with the horn boasted of himself, made himself great in front of the whole world, what happens? The large horn was broken, cut off. And in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. I'll tell you who they're talking about here. They're talking about Alexander the Great. They're talking about Alexander the Great. And if you think, again, in line of Daniel chapter 7, what was the third beast like? It was a leopard with four wings, which meant it was really, really fast, which is the equivalent of coming from the west, traveling over the whole earth without having to touch the ground. It's so fast. So you remember Alexander the Great conquered more 
territory on the planet Earth than any kingdom before his time. And he did it in like 12 years, I think it was. No king has ever accomplished as much as he did in such a short amount of time. But this is centuries before he was even born that Daniel is seeing this. And so what happened to Alexander Great? At the age of 33, he died from malaria and alcoholism. And some people say he was poisoned. Depends on what, what you read. But for sure, malaria and alcoholism. He was a total alcoholic and it killed him at the age of 33. So the mighty horn, as soon as he was mighty, he had conquered the whole, most of the world at that time, dies from a fever. He is cut off. What happened after that? Four kings fought over the Grecian kingdom. Um, four they are the four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. They covered his entire empire. So we need to stop here because the, part of the answer is this. How does God use pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel? Number one, God replaces pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel. How does God utilize Gentile rulers to achieve his destiny for Israel? God exchanges one for another Gentile rulers to achieve his future for Israel. Don't you see God in all of that? How could the ram overcome every single person he came across? And then when the goat comes, he has no power to resist him. Apart from God decreeing, I'm making a change. I'm allowing the Greeks to overcome I'm going to give the Persian Median kingdom. He allowed them to ride up to power. They magnified themselves. And then in the providence of God, he cut them down. All in God's fulfillment of what he's going to do for Israel. God replaces pagan kings. He is that sovereign over the political states. Not, not states as in the United States, but, but political countries that exist on this planet now, that he can move them according to his will. The northern kingdom, remember Israel split into two. The northern kingdom was called Israel. Ten of the kingdoms, ten of the, sorry, ten of the twelve tribes were part of the northern kingdom called Israel. They were taken captive by Assyria in 734 BC. They never returned to Israel so the 10 northern tribes are called the 10 lost tribes of Israel because they were taken by the Assyrians to the Assyrian Empire and they never came back. They just died away. The southern kingdom, which is what we're studying with Daniel, was called Judah, named after the largest tribe. So they only had two tribes, but because Judah was so big, people-wise, they were equivalent Judah would have been taken captive 70 years after Israel by the Babylonians. I'm sorry, about 100 years after the northern kingdom was taken captive. They returned to the homeland after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. But after they returned, they were still under the rulership of Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. And after Rome ransacked Jerusalem in AD 70, Israel was scattered throughout the world. And they did not come together as an, a people group again until 1948 when they were made an independent nation. So we have to see in that God's sovereignty in using pagan rulers because Israel has been under pagan rulers for a long, long time. And if you can imagine going from AD 70 to AD 1948 without having a country but still being a people group, You've got to see God's sovereignty in that. That does not happen. That has only happened of the people you see in the Old Testament. Only Israel survived without having a homeland that long. How does God use pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel? He replaces them, but he uses them over his people. I think the most likely, the most probable application for us as a Gentile church then would be to recognize that we need to be humble before the Lord, especially about Israel. We need to recognize that we are living in a time which is the fullness of the Gentiles, but ultimately, once the church is raptured, it's going to be, God, it's going to be about God fulfilling his promises to the Jewish people, to fulfill in the Abrahamic covenant. We need to be humble before the Lord by recognizing his sovereignty to accomplish his will for Israel even today. 
Romans 11.25, Romans 11.25, this is the Apostle Paul writing to a primarily Gentile church. Guess where? In Rome. I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. And here's the takeaway. So that you will not be wise in your own estimation. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. We've talked about this when we went through Romans. Until the last Gentile is saved, God has hardened Israel's heart. And so all Israel will be saved one day. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So we as Gentile believers and Americans at that need to be humble before God. And to be humble before God is to be bowed down before him. We need to recognize that he moves the future of the world forward according to his word, not only for us as American Christians, but especially for Israel. Don't be arrogant toward the Jews the way you hear so much arrogancy toward the Jews today. I just heard a report that a pastor in Florida either told his church or sent out a, a video through his media group that they ought to stay out of the synagogues because it's the Jews that are spreading the virus. This is a Christian. But we've got to recognize the anti-Semitism that exists in the church that flowed out of the Reformation as, as Luther came to this place where he hated the Jews for killing Christ. We've got to recognize how unbiblical and how satanic that is. Don't be arrogant toward the Jews. We need to stand up for them in the face of this anti-Semitism that we see growing in colleges, in politics, through the media. After all, Abraham is our spiritual father. God, Jews are God's chosen people and they will be saved by Yeshua and we know it. So my challenge for you as a church is, is, is to pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. It's not something I regularly do because I'm so fixated on North American Christianity. Pray for the salvation of the Jewish people so that there are some that don't have to go through what we're reading about. There are, they are members of the church, but also citizens of the kingdom before the Messiah returns. And maybe be bold enough to continue to pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. It's just not a one and done type thing. Oh, Pastor Jeff, yeah, good idea. You've got to remember that when Jesus says, when he, Jesus talks about the least of these, in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, and we always re make that a reference to taking care of the poor. He is literally talking about the Gentiles who take care of the Jewish kids during the tribulation. We miss that. Yes, a proper application would be to take care of all the people who need help. Yes. But the church needs to recognize that they are going to have a role and that Jesus is going to authenticate their faith based upon how they treat the Jews during the tribulation. So Gentiles who get saved during the tribulation need to help the Jews who get saved during the tribulation. So pray for them. And stay in tune. I, I offer you these vetted ministries who are sharing the gospel to Jews. Aerial ministries, I've talked about them before. Aerial ministries, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, a Messianic believer. Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, that's a new one. Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, they're, they're the group I found the information about this pastor from Florida on because they're talking all about it. CJFM, we've talked about them before, Christian Jewish Fellowship Mission. It's just a way to staying in tune and to not being myopic. You know, myopic is you only see through this little tunnel, but to recognize that this is a very Jewish Bible, Old Testament and New book, very Jewish book, Old Testament and New, and we don't have Jewish glasses, and so we miss it. But God is not. He is at work in the world to fulfill his promises to his people. How does God use pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel? Number one, God replaces pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel. Verse 9, out of one of the four conspicuous horns comes a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. So we see this horn, and it's growing toward this beautiful land, which we are going to interpret as Israel, the land flowing with milk and honey. It literally means bountiful. So we can connect these two things that suddenly now Israel is, is really in view. And we get this from the rest of the context too. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall down to the earth and it trampled them down. So we're getting this picture that if you can trample someone down, it means you have power over them. So this little horn extended to Israel 
Now, we've got to interpret the host of heaven. You know, it could either be angels. It could literally be the sun and the stars and the moon. But the context is sus- suggesting something more. If we've already are thinking the beautiful land is Israel, then maybe the host and some of the stars from the earth are actually Jewish people. If you read ahead in, in, um, in the chapter, you're going to recognize that this person is able to take down mighty men and, and faithful people. So when we think of God telling Abraham to look up at the sky and to look at the stars and say, you see all those stars up there? So will your people be. We have biblical support for interpreting this host and the stars as Jewish people. In verse 11, this little horn is going to magnify himself. Third time we've heard this. But this guy is going to make himself equal with the commander of the host. The prince, the official, the president. We see Jesus in this, obviously. He's going to make himself out to be God. And what's he going to do? Verse I'm sorry, at the rest of that verse. And he's going to remove it, the beast, is going to remove the regular sacrifice from him, from the commander of the host. So this small horn that grows exceedingly large is going to mess with the temple sacrifice, the continuous regular offering to Yahweh Elohim. And it's going to fling the truth to the ground, the, the truth about God, the truth about Christ, the truth about the coming kingdom. He is going to overpower it and perform its will. He's going to practice whatever he wants and he's going to be victorious. So at this point, you're thinking, wait a minute, didn't we hear something about this like last week? I mean, aren't aren't we talking about similar things here? And we are. So now I had to introduce this concept of dual fulfillment. Dual fulfillment. So we talked last week about the Antichrist blaspheming the most high God and and killing the tribulation saints. And and this stuff is very similar. And so the way you got to read prophecy is that it is true in real time, but it often is true forward. So to Daniel, who this, this is all in the future for, this is still prophecy in the real world. We're looking back from having the book of Revelation and saying, boy, I I see the Antichrist in that. And you should because there's a double fulfillment here. There's a real life person that's going to fulfill these prophecies. And it's also an overtone or an overture of what we read about the Antichrist in Revelation. And as you grow in your ability, as you mature in the faith, as you become spiritually mature and you grow more confident in your ability to handle the scripture, You'll recognize this concept that there are are these overtones or these overtures. My friend gave this to me. You know, if if you're a Broadway play fan or you know the concept, you know that before the play starts, they play the overture, which is comprised of all the songs, but only a few bars, only part of the theme. Later in the storyline, later in the future, the whole song is played and it's going to be in context and it's all going to make perfect sense. But before anybody has ever seen the play, you're just hearing a few bars. So that when it happens, you think, oh yeah, I heard that song in the overture. So as you come to prophecy, that's what you're listening for. These overtones that are most often being played fully in the book of Revelation. So this guy messes with the sacrifice. He tramples down the truth, the law of God. And he does whatever he wants to the Jewish people. Verse 13, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who is speaking. So God does Daniel a favor. This is so horrific what he sees. He, he has these angels talk to one another so that Daniel can overhear. And the one angel says to the next, How long is this going to last? How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? Now, I got to spend some time on this transgression causes horror because remember in, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 24, 15, when Jesus mentioned the abomination of desolation? That's this, the rebellion that causes desolation. The transgression is rebellion. The horror is making things desolate. So Jesus is not only talking about this prophecy right here, this transgression uh, with horror, 
But he's also going to be talking about the Antichrist. So every time you see in the Gospels him mention that, you now have a, you now have a perfect context for an, understanding what he's talking about. I'm overly excited. I'm sorry. I can't get it out fast enough. The transgression with horror is the abomination of desolation that Jesus references. So when he speaks that to the Jewish people, it's not the same as him speaking to us when we're like, what is he talking about? They knew. They knew what he was talking about because they had already lived through this literally, their people. They had it recorded in their history that this man did this to them. I'll move on. How long will this take place? The angel doesn't respond back to the angel. He says directly to Daniel for 2,300 evening and mornings. We have to make an interpretation about that. Because this is a real historical event, you can actually count the number of days where the sacrifice was stopped where truth was trampled down to the ground. And so there are various theories. I, I interpret things literally unless I can't. So 2,300 day, evening and mornings takes me back to Genesis chapter 1, day 1, evening and morning. The Hebrew calendar viewed the day not like we do at sunrise and sunset. They started it at dusk. A new day started at dusk. So I see this as 2,300 literal days. And after those days, the holy place, the sanctuary, the, the temple in Jerusalem will be put right by the Lord. So number two, how does God use pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel? God uses pagan kings to chastise Israel in preparation for his future for them. How does God utilize Gentile rulers to achieve his destiny for Israel? God utilizes Gentile rulers to discipline a stronger word that struggles with context today would be punish Israel in preparation for his future for them. So this man we're talking about is named Itiochus Epiphanes. And he was turned back by Egypt. He was a re leader in Greece from 175 BC to 164 BC. He was turned away by the Egyptians. So he came into Israel and he was mad. And what did he find in Jerusalem? But Jews who were wanting to absorb Grecian culture and Grecian religious practice into their Judaism. So they were, the, they were syncretists, right? They were worldly minded. They didn't want to combat or resist the Grecian influence on their faith in Yahweh. They wanted to absorb it all. They were worldly. So in comes Atiochus Epiphanes into this scene where Half of the group were Hellenists, half of the Jews were Hellenists, and half were traditionalists. And Antiochus Epiphanes got in the middle of this, and what did he do? All right, you Jews are fighting over how your religion is going to be. I'm going to make sure that there is no Jewish influence at all in Jerusalem. So he made circumcision punishable by death. Could you imagine what that would do to Jews who are trying to live according to the law? He made them eat pig flesh. He made them worship pagan gods. And the, the transgression with horror or the abomination of desolation is he sacrificed pigs on the altar to Yahweh Elohim. And he so perverted and desecrated the temple that when under the Maccabean revolt, under the Maccabean revolt, when the Jews kicked out Antiochus Epiphanes, they couldn't, it was so gross and perverted in the temple. They, they all basically had to rebuild the whole thing. It was so disgusting what he did in there. All to chastise Israel in preparation for the coming Messiah. For their lack of faith, for their worldly mindedness, for their idolatry, for their adultery. The text says that this happened to his sanctuary. And this happened to his, meaning Yahweh's regular sacrifice. And God let it happen because in his sovereignty, he worked through it. The most likely application then for us as a Gentile church is to recognize we don't want to be chastised by the Lord. We don't want to be disciplined or punished for being worldly minded. So we need to be sensitive to the things of the world that have invaded the church and still want to invade the church. And we need to repent of being worldly minded Christians. First John 2 15, first John 2 15 says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the father, but it's from the world. 
The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. I'm not going to take the time to exegete all that. But basically what it's saying is worldly mindedness is proof of carnality, of living like a pagan, of not living in the spirit of not having eternal life living in you because you're living for the world. You're living for the temporal. You're living for your flesh. You're living to boast in life. And that's cutting heaven off from earth. Being focused on the natural rather than the spiritual is to be worldly minded. It's not to say that we're not practical or pragmatic. It's to say that we don't do so without bringing the Lord into those things. 1 Corinthians 2.14 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Pray to God for salvation of a family member? Pray to God for healing? For protection? How foolish, the natural man says. He can't understand them because they're spiritually appraised. You know the value of prayer during times like this? The natural man, that is so dumb. But he who is spiritual appraises all things. Church, we see the world completely differently because the Holy Spirit illumines things to us that the world has no discernment to understand. We can see with an eternal perspective. And so things have different value. Life and death are completely turned on their head for the Christian. Death is the vehicle by which we get into glory. For the natural man, death is the worst thing that could possibly happen. For us, it's the best. But worldly-minded Christians don't live in the reality of that. Paul continues, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? So no natural man is going to be able to say to a Christian, that's so stupid, because they don't know the Lord. We don't know the Lord perfectly, but we can claim and profess confidently that we have the mind of Christ. We have the ability to appraise things as they truly are, as they are in God's reality, not man's. To miss God's powerful and spiritual work in the lives of people through the word of God for the sake of the things of this world is to be worldly. It's something of which we need to repent of so that God does not have to chastise or discipline us as a church. To fail to interpret things biblically, or I'll use the synonym spiritually, is to have your mind set on the things of this earth and not of the things that are above, which Scripture explicitly commands us not to do. Colossians 3.1, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. We are to be so heavenly minded that we do the most good on earth. We recognize that the, that saying, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good, is from the pit of hell. But we feel guilty about that, don't we? So we hold back living for Jesus in this world because we don't want that pegged on us. That is being the natural man, church, not the spiritual one. We need to repent of looking to the world to be our savior from things. When we have a savior, he dwells within us. He has made this church. He wants to use this church. We need to repent of trusting in money to be our savior from difficult circumstances. Money matters, right? But it can matter too much for people. We need to repent of trusting in money to bring us hope, to buy us love, to fulfill us somehow, apart from looking to Christ for help. We need to repent of trusting in the things of the flesh to be our savior from bad feelings or hopelessness. To repent of of, um, looking to the glory and the honor that comes to us from other people to affirm us when we're made in the image of Christ. We seek their affirmation. We will do things just so they praise us. That is living into the boastful pride of life. We don't want to trust in our own knowledge or intellect to solve our problems without ever looking to Christ. That's not the church's job or role. It's not what God wants from us. These are the things that Christ wants to reveal to us. So we need to confess. We need to confess of those things we look to for salvation to save us from some earthly feeling or thought and we don't even look to Christ. We look to money, sex, power, food, love. Colossians 3, 9 says, Do not lie to one another. Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and put on the new self who is being renewed 
to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew. So go before the Lord and be honest with yourself. When have you looked to the things of this world to be your savior from difficult circumstances without looking to Christ first or without bringing, to, bringing the Lord into that difficult circumstance continually and allowing him to reveal the earthly resources he's going to provide for you to help? Repent. Repent of worldly-mindedness and pursue Christ instead by thinking spiritually of everything going on in the world, thinking with an eternal perspective of what's happening out there. When you recognize the sovereignty of God and using pagan kings to accomplish his future for Israel, your love should grow for him more because you realize that he is not only sovereign over Israel, he is sovereign over Spring Creek. You recognize the importance of being the church because God wants to use it You recognize that he is the sovereign Lord over our mission, over who we are to be, how we are to behave, because it all reflects upon the supreme ruler who saved you. I close with our sovereign God's expectation for us as a church. This is Colossians 3.12. I view this as what heaven's going to be like. I view this as what the church should be if it is humble before the Lord. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, where other place can you be affirmed that you are holy and loved by God, but the church? So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Where else are you going to go for that these days? It's supposed to be Spring Creek. It's supposed to be the church as we serve our sovereign Lord We bear with one another. We forgive one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord has forgiven us individually, we we forgive one another. Where else are you going to receive that? But under the church, guided by the sovereign Lord. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. We worship a sovereign Lord who is sovereign over this church. Amen.